come to the start finish line again. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to round number eight of the Tour Peak Racing Touring Car Championship from Daytona International Speedway's road course in the booth this, um, this evening, even, is Orbinson and Oscar Hardwick. Oscar, hello. Hello, everybody. And we are currently looking at the last part of qualifying. The um, Ford Falcon V8 supercars are currently on track. And you can tell that we are racing under the lights here at Daytona International Speedway. This 11 turn, 3.56 mile racetrack. Famous for not only holding the Daytona 500, but also the Rolex 24 hour race as well. And obviously, the Raw before the 24. And this track, Oscar, is as fast as it gets. And what it means is that the Ford Falcons and the Caddies are a lot more mixed up than they'd usually be. Yeah, you've taken the words right out of my mouth. I mean, if you look at Frederick Follerstad and Renz Brokerman, who have you know, each been the, the class of their fields, there's only just 1.1 seconds in it, and that's a third of what we've seen before now. And Renz Brokerman actually has just gone even closer within a second of Frederick Follerstad. And it, it's all to do with the fact that this V8 supercar, in comparison to the Cadillac, has got so much more power and top-end speed. But even though it is much slower through the corners, with the long straights and sweeping bank corners here at the Daytona Road Course, the, the V8's just going to keep with the Cadillac all the way. Yeah, in fact, so I had a chat with Frederick Follestad the, um, the other day, and he said that a lot of the V8s are going to be a lot higher on the grid, which obviously we, see we can see at the moment. And on lap number one, we expect the V8 to really put pressure on the caddies when they get onto the banking. The Cadillacs are going to have to try drive their hearts out for the first half of that lap, use the advantage they'll get on the infield, and then hope that they've got enough of a gap to the V8 coming onto the banking, down into the bus stop chicane, and then back all the way around towards turn number one. And what that means is that this field is going, to, this race is going to be completely different to what we've seen otherwise. In some ways, it's actually similar to what you'd see. Um, in some of the prototype series is with the HPDs and the Corvettes and the Corvettes are that much faster than the HPDs and today it really is going to be something a little bit similar to that what we're going to do is we're going to enjoy the last couple of moments of qualifying just having a look at the number 22 machine of Istvan Balau coming through the bus stop chicane and um, Oscar when we talk about this track we really are um, a couple of key points. The biggest ones are just simply turn one and the bus stop. But you've also got the international horseshoe and probably turn number seven getting onto the banking as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been the last one that you mentioned there, coming back onto the banking, because there's two or three different lines that you can execute and maintain pace with people. But with the new tyre model and the these you know fairly heavy rear wheel drive cars actually getting power down out of the corner it all falls away from you and you can't see it or really feel it until it's too late so a lot of prior knowledge needed for people going quickly through there and then as you say turn one huge braking zone probably the biggest braking zone of the season for these guys with the speed that they're going to be carrying into it we see the checker flag is out on the racetrack these drivers have got themselves one more lap to set themselves a qualifying time and we talked about Renz Brokerman. He is now seven tenths of a slower, only slower than Frederick Follestad. Could this be the race that Renz Brokerman actually managed to get first overall? We're going to have to keep an eye out on that because I really do think that, you know, Brokerman's in a class of field in that 84 machine. If the likes of Follestad and Dan Silver's DG are not on their absolute game, this is going to be one crazy crazy race and it'll be toing and throwing to the line as well um and you see now the cars are lining up on the grid unlike what we've seen throughout the entirety of the talk Creek racing touring car championship we are going to get ourselves a rolling start i believe here um i'm, I'm not sure not. i was about to say uh, the pace car looks to be well off the track and 
these guys are on the banking. Yeah, we are lining up on the banking at the start-finish line. We're going to go through the grid. Frederick Follestad is in the pole position in the Cadillac. Rens Brokerman is in second position in the V8 supercar. And then um, Marcelo Mayo is in third position in the Caddy. Darren Seal in the Caddy is in fourth. Nick Vestigi in the Caddy is in fifth. Thomas Van Bruce in the V8 supercar is in the sixth position. And Kerestoff in seventh and Joe Jr. in eighth. They are in the Caddies. Peter Ridley in ninth is in the V8 supercar. Adam Terry in tenth. 10th is in the Cadillac, and Fabian J is in 11th position, Terry Dalberg in 12th, Andy Goodison 13th, Danny Barrows in 14th, Adam Pahl in 15th, Esteban Balau 16th, Dave Geimer 17th, Stephen Coppins in 18th, Roderick Cronin 19th, Andy Griffiths in 20th, Christian Nielsen 21st, Ian Mabbitt in 22nd, Andrew Streetly 23rd, Phil Jocelyn 24th, Simon Hill in 25th, Scott Malcolm in 26th, William Pioneer 27th, our non-qualifiers Kevin Beekman and Robert Burton. And this is going to be a very crazy start coming down into turn number one. The fastest entry into corner we will see all season long. And let's not forget as well, these cars are on 30 degrees of banking on a standing start. Oscar, in 10 seconds, tell me what you think is going to happen. A large accident. I know that, that was less than 10 seconds. Well, here we go. <sighs> okay, then. We are waiting for those lights to come on. There they are. And they're away. And you see it there, Freddie Pollestad. He's got sideways from the pole position. Reds Brokeman is second. He's got a slow start. He's going to have Mark and Mario on the inside of him coming down into turn and ball. And watch out, guys. Too wide through the field. And this is where Titan Top coming down into turn number two. We've got a spin up. And a spin up. Oh. Big pile up. Big pile up there. We've got four, five cars involved. And we'll get ourselves away through that because we are too wide still as they come out of turn number three down into the international horsey for the first time. And Fabian Just Red is on the outside of Joe Jr. And these two drivers going like that. That is crazy stuff. Yeah. Two people that I picked up going there was Andy Creostot has written off his car and it looks like Darren Seal may well be out of this one too. Nick Vestici is out of the race. I just saw him slowing down. So some big names affected early on. Istvan Balal in the number 22 machine. He has also got issues to his race car. We will get ourselves all those drivers involved. But Vestici and Kerestoff have retired from the race. Meanwhile, through the field, this is the point now where the V8 supercars are going to have that advantage. Caddies, hold on. As you see, the going too wide. This is where you have to have to be careful. As the Caddy's going to have to take one line, the V8 to the other. You don't want two on stocking and weaving out from. You have still got Frederick Pollestad as your race leader. Um, Marcello Mayo is in second position, but Red Brokerman is right behind there in the third position. In fact, he's gaining on Mayo as they come through the bus stop for the first time. This is the longest part of the straightaway now. Flick it all the way through the gears onto that 31 degrees of banking. Coming through turns number three and four of the oval, and Brooklyn really is closing. And behind, you've got Thomas Van Brussel sat fourth overall, with Tyler Dalberg in fifth in the Cadillac as they come across the start finish line for the first time. You see that Vince Brokerman is right there. In fact, he's going to take second in class as they come past second overall, but it's a break early, and that allows Mayo to just get ahead coming down into turn number one. And Mayo yeah, goes just... wide, Mayo goes wide. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Still seeing too wide everywhere at the moment. I don't know where to look. But, uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is the fact that this is obviously right under the lights, which means there is a lot more grip on these tyres, but with these huge um, engines in these cars, what it means is you don't always want that extra grip, and you're going to see these cars spinning. As you see, oh, there we go. Tire, he's wide, and that is going to allow Renz Brokerman to dive down the inside, move Renz Brokerman up into second overall, and Thomas Van Boussel is right behind him as they come into the banking. And this is where poor little Mar <laughs> Marco Mario is going to have to hold on. Well, Van Boussel is possibly. I don't know if he's maybe too far back, but he may well put himself into third position overall. Uh, that, that would show the, uh, the V8 supercar is having the upper hand. Although I think it's fair to say that we have no idea. Just to give you an update on the drivers involved in that turn one incident, you had Adam Terry in the number 12 machine. You had the number 37 of Darren Seal. The number 43 of Andy Kerstoff in the 48 car of Nick Vestigi. All of those are out of the race, as is Kevin Vickerman and Robert Burton as well. They did not take the green flag. Thomas Van Boutsel, he is closing on um, 
Ma yeah, he's closing on uh, Marcelo Mayo. Um, but Frederick Follister, mercifully, has got himself enough of a lead that that V8 cannot draft up to the rear of um, Follister. And one thing that's interesting, Oscar, is that uh, Mayo can really hang on in the draft coming um, once he's behind. If he's outside, he is freight train. But if he's behind, he can actually hold that gap. He has lost the position to Solis van Bussel. So Bussel's now into the third position, but it does look as though Mayo can at least hold the rear of the draft. And now this is where Mayo's got to at least try and get himself an advantage on this infield. But passing through from turn number one all the way through to turn six is very difficult. And his biggest chance is either going to be on the brakes into turn one or on the brakes into the bus stop. Well, yeah, like you say, it doesn't surprise me that the Cadillac can keep with the V8 supercar in the draft. And I don't know if it might be in Marcelo's best interest to just stick with these two fastest V8 supercars at the moment. Provided that it's holding the gaps to the people behind, they're never going to be able to get near him on the straights. Um, so, um, Joe Jr., he managed to just get around Andy Griffiths. Joe Jr. has actually gained two positions in the last couple of laps. Move him up into ninth position overall. Um, just to give you an update, class by class, because things really are crazy here right now. We have got ourselves Frederick Fonestad leading away in the Cadillac field. Markello Mayo is in the second position. Terry Dalberg in third. Adam Terry in fourth and Stephen Coppins in the fifth position. Then over to the V8 supercars. Renz Brokeman is currently sat in the first position with Thomas Van Busel 1.2 seconds behind. Fabian Jay in the third position. Danny Bowers in fourth. And we're just running out your top five. And having a look at the battle for what is essentially the overall lead. Brokerman is actually holding his own against Frederick Follisberg. Having a little bit of a look back through the field, you have got yourself caddies mixed up with V8 supercars all the way down. Just having a look in fact, and Peter Ridley has had a great lap here. He is getting himself up a couple of positions. He is now sat in the 12th spot in that midfield battle. He's got Roger Cronin right behind him. And you just see how Cronin... Oh, he's gone off. Yeah, he literally goes wide. Cronin almost throws him off into the car. He wasn't able to make the move happen there. And what this means is that he's going to be stuck behind him throughout the middle of this lap. He's actually trying the outside line into the international horseshoe, turn number three. And then getting at very least on the inside, he's going to try and poke his way through as they go through turn four and five. But Cronin is not quite close enough. Oh, uh, this and is further back, we've just seen Christian Nusslian. I don't know if he got a tap there. He's gone straight off the track. Christian Nusslian uh, was sat in the 14th position, having a look back to see what happened to him. It was coming out of the International Horseshoe. In fact, he just clipped the grass and made a silly little mistake. And it's beard and right when he's supposed to be going left into turn four. He loses himself a position there to Andrew Streetley. So a bit of a daft move there by Christian Nielsen. He does recover, does keep all four walls pinning in the right direction, but lost himself a good couple of positions there. Yeah, and now... Uh just looking back, Roderick Croyne, and nothing that he can do on this oval section of track. Yeah, he's nowhere near close enough to make even the biggest of lunges down into the bus stop chicane. Would not be good enough. You see that he's trying to have a look as they go for the second part. This would be his only chance if he can get close enough coming into the bus stop to just try and die underneath him as they go through the second part of the apex. But then he's losing time all the way down. This must be so disheartening. Well, that number 29 still see his radical car as he comes out of turn number four off banking turn 12 on this racetrack through the tri -oval, which for some strange reason doesn't actually have a turn number. And then as they come down to turn number one again, he is close, but not quite close enough. It'll be interesting. I mean, if Roderick can maybe stop sliding his car around on the infield and get close enough, he might be able to make use of the draft that we spoke about earlier. I mean, this is the first time this season, I believe, that the Cadillac has had to use sixth gear. It's, it's geared very, very long. So if you've got enough draft, as I see someone go off in the background, I'll have a look at who that was. Adam Pahl has just decided to straight line the international horseshoes. Christian Nusslian has also decided to get squirrely once again. Same place. And also, Marcello Mayo is out of the race. He lost it, I believe, into turn number one just a lap or so ago. His day is done. Out front, it is still um, 
I've got that all completely muddled up. He's still Frederick Forrest and the gap between himself and Renz Brokeman is, however, only 1.2 seconds. Now, it's only going to be a couple of attempts more before Brokeman can get a draft from Frederick Forrest and when you consider the fact that as they approach the start finish line, we'll get yourself some accurate data, but it's about 20 kilometers an hour. If you want that in old money, then that is, as Forrestad comes across the line, he's doing 172 miles an hour. Rens Brokerman, 182, closing. The gap is now down to nine tenths of a second. Rens Brokerman here is trying to become the first VA driver to win in the Talk for Racing Touring Car Championship, there is no better place on this series for him to have the chance to do so. And he's putting on a great turn at that number 84 machine. And to add insult to injury to all the other drivers, he has dropped Thomas Van Bussel now by 1.9 seconds. Todd Alberg and Happy and um, Jay, they are going too wide. We've got a spinner there as they come to It's Ridley Brooklyn. and Croynan. They've come together. Yeah, they have. And oh, and they're right in the middle of traffic. Oh, dear. That was bad. And Peter Ridley, it just looks as though he caught a bump on the... He just hit the wall, speared across the track, got T-boned there by Roger Cronin. And, yeah, it just looks like they're both those days are done. And there's so much drama going on in the middle of this track. Drivers having to sweep to avoid everyone and everything. Christian Nilsson just managed to get it away there. In fact, he almost lost it as he came into the International Horseshoe. Run it very, very wide, but kept it on the race track. And then ahead of him, you had Andy Goodison spinning it as they came out of the International Horseshoe. So, it looks as though we're currently working lap number six. We're 12 minutes into this race. These drivers are really starting to pressurise each other. And I think a lot of frustration is coming in here. If you just have a look at replay of um, the incident that was coming through out of turn number one. Meanwhile, this is very close on the racetrack. You have Ian Mabbott, who is right behind this Van Bala, who in turn is right behind Scott Malcolm. In fact, he's going to have a look to the high side. Dave Geimer, very slow on the apron there. I think he has some issues. But that is the speed there. Um, Scott Malcolm losing out to this Van Bala just because of the fact Bala has a 10 mile an hour advantage. Me and to show how effective this draft is, Wrench Brokeman has closed that gap to four tenths of a second over. Frederick Follestad. This is going to be one of the most interesting battles we have seen all season long in the Talk Creek Racing Touring Car Championship with Renz Brokeman lapping faster than Frederick Follestad. And if you want to know the significance about that, the V8 Supercars are normally at least three seconds a lap slower than the Cadillacs. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really intriguing to watch at the moment. And Another thing that comes to mind is I've been driving the Cadillac a lot myself recently and, and also a bit of the V8 on the new time bar. I think the Cadillac chews up the tyres more. But is it, it does. possible to consider that, you know, Frederick Follestad, through the section of the lap where that Cadillac is meant to be getting an, an advantage, throughout the race that advantage is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So this gaining at the moment isn't necessarily Frederick, you know, making mistakes on laps. This could just be the natural progression of the race. Would it be surprising to see Renz Brokeman not only pass but then pull away from Frederick Follestad at this stage? If Brokeman can get ahead of Follestad, Brokeman, and this sounds cliche, but he will win the race. The simple fact that when you need to have the grip is, um, uh, where Follestad will need to have the grip of these big braking zones, and as those tyres go away, you won't have that grip to make those huge lunges down the inside into places like turn number one. As the gap across the line, this time by it, it's back up to nine tenths of a second. But Follestad looking very slow into turn number one to that time by. In fact, it goes a little bit wide. But um, for Follestad, he can have all the grip he wants in the middle section of that racetrack. But he's going to have to make the pass. And if his tyres are going off, he won't be able to make a big lunge either. As I say, coming into the International Horseshoe, coming through turns number four and five. And if he can't make a move, he's not going to win the straight line speed battle. So, Brokerman probably knows this. And he's just probably hounding Follestad, seeing if he can make a mistake. Because for Brokerman, he, again, he's like got a three and a half second lead now in the V8 class. But he wants that glory. You know what I mean? He's got a solid 17 minutes to play with at the moment. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. 
I, I, I do want to follow this, but then at the same time I want to be watching the action that we've got through the rest of the field, because still we've got Cadillacs fighting each other, V8 supercars fighting Cadillacs, and Christian Nuslin has decided to go off at the International Horseshoe again. Again. Not the best of days for Christian. It's unfortunate because he's had a few really strong showings so far this season. Yeah, in fact, we got ourselves some good battles all the way through the field. I mean, for example, Adam Terry, Joe Jr., they are having a good battle in the Cadillac field for sixth and seventh position overall, second and third in the Cadillac field. In fact, and Andy Griffiths, he had a moment there coming out of turn number four. He spun the car around. He's lost himself a ton of time. In fact, I think he got himself into Stefan Coppen. Stefan Coppen's in the number 81 Torquil Tracing Machine. Just collected. No, oh, there was so those inches away there. Coppen managed to get away with that. But that is going to put um, Griffiths on the back foot. But a little bit further back from him, we also have Christian Nielsen out the street and fighting for position. Christian Nielsen is lost out, but he's trying to gain his way back to the field. A little bit further back, we've still got Phil Johnson, this is my foul. We've got Malcolm. Joe yeah, Jr. is Christian having a look. Back. Not to that side, he isn't. And he doesn't make it happen that time by. I have to say, Brokeman is starting to lose ground to Forestad. Those last couple of laps, um, Forestad has actually eats out another tenth and a half a second. And as you were saying, Oscar, in the fact that his tyres might go away, do you think Forestad just took it easy for the first half of this race, knowing that how close um, Brokeman could get behind him before it become too dangerous, and is now trying to get that gap back up so that come the end of the race, Brokerman isn't going to have enough to respond with. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising, Frederick is going throughout the season, that if he wants to control the pace of a race, then he definitely will do. Granted, that's only been with the Cadillac field, but I would not put it past him. I mean, I think Follestad, he, he knows what he's doing with this, and he respects Renz Brokerman because Renz has won, I think, every race so far this season in the V8 class, so he's just going to maintain the gap and with a bit of luck, save his tyres so that he doesn't have to race for it. You're just having a look at Joe Jr. a moment ago. Currently sat third in the Cadillac class, seventh overall. Joe Jr. has had himself a very difficult season today, but this third place finish in the Cadillac class is really going to do him well. In fact, just having a look back to Brokerman, he has closed that gap right down as they come past the start finish line. It's back down to six tenths of a second. Follis had had a very difficult last part of lap this time, last time by. And now, Brokeman is right back in at that draft zone. But with Joe Jr. as I say... Thomas Van Busel's gone system. off at Turn 1. He's facing backwards on the exit. And Van Busel, he is going to lose himself a couple of positions. He's got Van no, he isn't. closing behind him. But if Busel can get it back going, he might just survive. Um, um, Fabian J is now about two seconds behind. So, a lucky escape there for Van So In fact, he was the only driver in the same time zone as Brokerman and Follister. And now he's lost himself an entire nine seconds in the space of one corner there. And Van Boosel, very lucky to get away with that because Fabian J um, was ready. In fact, he probably is now ready to pounce. And let's not forget, Van Boosel is going to have very hot tyres. There's going to be little grip on that. And Van Boosel is probably very happy the fact that we're running this race at night. That was another incident into turn number one, and that is um, Andy Goodison. Oh, Andy Goodison, Goodison down making inside. pass. Yeah, and that's when Chris Nielsen, that was a great drive there, almost getting it into the wall as he tried to sort it out, did Andy Goodison. He managed to get that job done. That puts him in the V8 class up into the seventh position. And we've got ourselves a nice battle from Christian Nielsen, Andy Goodison, Isman Balao, Phil Jocelyn, all separated by less than four seconds on the racetrack. So that one is far from over. In fact, Phil Jocelyn and Isman Balao, they're having a great battle as they come down now into turn number five. I'll tell you who I think is going to be even closer at the line this time. It's going to be very close. You see that up to 184 miles an hour, but he's going to have to get Three a bit earlier. And I tell you what, if this comes down to the last lap, Brokerman could get it. I think a thing that really is gaining roughly a tenth, two tenths on that last bit of banking there on yeah, it, the car in front. He doesn't gain it until, as having a look on board with Brokerman now, he doesn't gain it until the banking falls away. They're running 31 degrees of banking in the corners, and that seems to. Um, 
try up the um, V8 a little bit and help the Cadillac, as soon as the banking falls away, it's 15 degrees of banking, I believe, on the front straightaway, and what that means is that at that point, the V8 just starts flying. Um, looks like Brokeman lost himself a little bit of time in the first part of this lap. He's not as close to um, the rear of Fonestad, um, but again, he will start closing as soon as this banking falls away onto the back straightaway. The banking completely disappears, and once they get into the bus stop, you will start seeing him close dramatically. You see his. Ah, hold on. Oh no, I, I lost Renz for a moment there. I think that might have been me. Never mind. And he is back on, and so he's come through turn three and four. He's close, but he's not quite close enough, and I think he's lost the draft this time by it. So he had a difficult lap, and that will put him back outside that one second mark. But we've got ourselves less than 10 minutes to go. To translate that into laps, we've got ourselves about four laps to go here at the Tona International Speedway. He's going to have him. It, it's so difficult to read, but look at this. He's going to be this very closer close. at the line. He's going to break early. He's going to have to break early. And it was three turns per second again as they came across the line. He gave himself two one hundredths that last lap. If he can keep it together and do himself a blister in first second, you just saw how close he got to the attenuator as they came um, through turn number one. You see the pit wall, um, pit wall just reappears in the middle of the apex. And if he can keep it to go for the first, his first sector and gain up into the bus stop, he really has got a good chance. Looking a little bit back further through the field though, that battle between Andy Goodison, Christian Nielsen, Phil Jocelyn, and Isman Balao in the B8 class. Goodison's pulled away a little bit. Christian Nielsen, however, is under severe attack from you know, Jocelyn and Balao. One mistake for any of these drivers, they're going to lose themselves a good couple of positions. And in the caddy class, we've still got a great battle now between Joe Jr., second in class, he's just overtaking Danny Bowles to put him a lap down. And then we've got ourselves Adam Terry right behind Jr., Tower Dalberg is only a second further behind. In fact, to take that back, Dalberg's actually lost himself a bit of time this lap. He's fallen back by about a half a second in the first sector of this lap alone. And this is he's going to lose himself a little bit more as Andy Griffiths, uh, not Andy Griffiths, is Danny Bowles even. Danny Bowles will come back into the picture for the simple fact that um, he's going to have the horsepower for the banking. Now take it back, Danny Bowles has actually sat fifth overall, fourth in the V8 class. So apologies to Danny Bowles for putting your lap down when he won. And by the way, we've got us off Peter Ridley sat in pit lane in the number 19 machine. That is going to drop him dramatically back. He's sat in the 23rd position, four laps down. And having a look back to Fulstad, coming down into turn one, there. Brokerman lost himself seven tenths of a second that last lap. Did you see any TV screens there? It's um, Frederick Cronin. He's saw a big lot of dust there from Frederick Fulstad coming down into turn number five. Having a look at Roderick Cronin, um, who is currently doing himself a nice and dandy job in the number 29 machine, even though he is three laps down. Oh, um, and who's that? Andrew Streetly has blown his engine. It looks like he's gone up into the outside wall in the oval turn one. So Andrew Streetly's day is done. He is smoking and smoking hard. He's trying to bring that car down to pit lane, but he will not get himself anything there. In fact, he just lost it as he came... Oh, that is a weird place to lose it. He lost it... Onto the bank, he got onto the banking. He talked about this at the start of the broadcast. He put the power down, but I think he just clipped that yellow line as he really followed the throttle, and the car just speared right into the wall. And he, he's driving that car back to pit lane, but that is not going to survive the rest of this race. No, I, I mean that that has had it, but turn seven such a tricky one. And it's not that the corner itself is difficult to do, but it becomes so unpredictable so quickly that. It is surprisingly easy to make mistakes like that. And, and you see Frederick Follisad now. He has got that smoke screen ahead of him of um, Andrew Streetly. He's trying to make his way back down to pit lane. That would distract Follisad just a little bit. At the same time, you're going to have yourself wrench broken. And he's closed a little bit this last time by. Five minutes left to go here in the Talk with Racing Touring Car Championship on Glacier TV. Seven the tenths. gap is back down to less than seven tenths of a second as they come down to turn number one again. And if Fernstein makes a solitary mistake, Brokerman is going to try and find his way past. 
and you're watching round eight of the Torquay Crimson and Tour. Istvan Blau, Balau rather, has gone off the track and lost himself a whole handful of positions. And that car is crabbing and crabbing bad. You saw he had some damage all the way from turn number one on lap one in that 22 car. He's been able to drive it back, as um, we talk about so often on many of the broadcasts. This one, Balau, is one of those kings of the hard charger. He does it so often in the afternoon in car series, so often in the top racing, touring cup and super cups. But he has lost himself a ton of time now, and you can put him all the way down behind Ian Mabbott, um, who's lost the position. No, sorry, Ian Mabbott is, I believe, um, in the caddy class. Um, but he's lost himself a couple of positions there, Isaman Balau, and he's fallen behind Christian Nielsen now. So he's lost himself two positions in class. Well, you're talking about the fantastic first sector from Renz Brokerman, and he's just done it. That's the closest he has been out of turn two in terms of the oval all it day. Is I so mean, he's following it Frederick so Bolsad through the bus stop now. He is going to have him, he's going to overtake him before turn one. If he can get the drive, he didn't get the bus stop perfectly nailed. He's going to have to really suck up to that draft coming through turns number three and four of the oval turn 12. For some reason, they call it two corners in NASCAR, only one corner in here. You see, follow that on the radio. He is scared as Franklin to the outside for the first time. A V8 is leading through the talk for creating touring car championship with less than four minutes to go. Brokeman is leading as they come into turn number one. Don't mess it up now. And he takes away the race lead. No, I wouldn't. I mean, does Frederick, is Frederick going to race this as though it's just for class? Is he going to think, I've got absolute light years? No, he's not. He is going to race this one for the win. And goes down to the inside. He retakes that position down into turn number five. That is where he has more grip. And now he's got to try and charge his way through turns number four and five. This is going to be a fight for the ages for the last three minutes or so of this race. They are coming down into turn number five now. If Brokerman can keep it together, he will have a chance once again as they come onto the banking. And Brokerman, he set himself up. He lost himself a bit of time there, actually, in turn number five. But he set himself up that last lap. He knows how close he needs to be out of the bus stop to make the pass happen down onto the start finish line. This is still, but, fair, this is still very close coming out of that. Um, infield section of the track. I mean, it looks as though he's lost tons and tons of time, but we underestimated earlier just how much time the V8s are gaining back on the oval section of this track. I mean, look, he just pulls back up to the rear when they get to the bus stop, and he can do the same again, even if he is slower through the bus stop. Yeah, he has to be careful there. He doesn't want to get himself too close in the bus stop because otherwise he will have to really compromise his braking. It's that thing. Sometimes you have to go slow, slower, but slower to go fast. This time, it looks as though he's going to be very close once again. Follestad and Brokeman, this is history in the making here in the Torquay Racing Toy Car. A little bit of a wobble there by Brokeman, but he will still have the outside line. So come by to the flag once again. We have got ourselves just a couple of laps left to go here. Brokeman back to the point overall as they come down to turn number one again. Follestad now is back on the rear foot, but he's going to have to make that charge down into somewhere like the International Horseshoe again where the Cadillacs have the advantage this is where they do on this infield section so keep an eye on Frederick Follestad as you see that Brokerman taking the outside line in fact this time he has the line but he goes wide a little bit and that is going to allow Follestad to get the car inside and he's back past here but I, I just don't think that that's worrying Renz Brokerman at all I think that he knows okay you go past me here but provided I don't make anything go horribly wrong for myself through the next few corners, I'll have you before the start-finish line, and that's what matters. Renz Brokeman, at the moment, is in the strongest position to take the win of this race. And we talk about how sometimes you just see a little bit of magic. This race has presented the opportunity for the impossible here. And Renz Brokeman is putting that charge on. He sees they come onto the banking again. He's just as close as he was that last time. In fact, he's probably just a little bit closer as they level that banking off. Follows that saying, look, just pick a line and I'll make sure I don't block you. But he is so close going to the bus stop now that he has to be careful that he doesn't get too close. And you see a little bit of tire smoke there from Follows that as they come out of the bus stop. But this is going to be very, very close as to when we're going to get the white flag. Are we going to have ourselves one more lap? I think so. I mean, they're not lacking in any quicker than 145, so yeah, this will be the white flag lap. They're going to get well, the white flag at the line, 
We will get confirmation. We will get the white flag this time by Rens Brokerman. He got past a lot earlier here. He did have to do it at the last minute. Rens Brokerman, as they come to the white flag, he has got himself the race lead here by five tenths of a second. But Forestan is going to have the advantage through the second part of the race track. He is now going to be hunting Brokerman like a hawk as they come through turns number two and three down into the international horseshoe. Bonestad is just going to have to make sure if he can get him past now. This is going to be the chance to do it, but he does Oh, Brokerman! Oh, that is going to be close, but it's single file for the next corner. Bonestad remembers that he has got himself the Cadillac class win in the bag here. He doesn't want to risk that one as they come down into turn number five for the final time. Bonestad, he's hunting on the outside line, and one thing that he is going to have to be very careful about is that he doesn't make too big a move as he's going down the inside now into turn number six not quite close enough but into the bus stop Follestad if he can time this right and put Brokeman offline this could be his only chance they got lap traffic ahead of them as they were onto the banking that is Christian Nielsen currently going to be going one lap down if he's not careful Rens Brokeman is your race leader Frederick Follestad in second and I think Brokerman might just be close enough there to keep the lead through the bus stop chicane. And he does. Yeah, Brokerman's got it. Brokerman's got it. There's no, yeah, indeed. That's it. Now he's just going to push it to the line. There's nothing whatsoever that Frederick Follestad can do from there. So, Rens Brokerman coming through turn number 12 for the final time. Off of turn number four of the banking, we have seen so many famous finishes at the Tona International Speedway. But as he comes onto the trioval, Rens Brokeman makes history as he wins in the Tall Creek Racing Touring Car Championship, the first ever V8 driver to do so. And history has been made here at Daytona. Frederick Forstad comes home second overall, but wins in the Cadillac class. And we are nating now for the drivers to come flying through. Thomas Van Boussel comes across the line to take second in the V8 Supercars with Fabian J just coming through the banking now. He will claim third position in the V8 class, fourth overall. And now we're Good battle going on here Jr. between Joe Jr. and Adam Terry. Joe Jr. is going to hold on to it at the line to take second position in the Cadillac class and Adam Terry a well-deserved third. Terry Dalberg will come home fourth in the Cadillac class. Danny Bowles will come home in fourth in the V8 class. And this is why things get very, very confusing. So we're just going to settle down and sort of let this one figure itself out. But we said coming into this race, this is going to be one of the most interesting that we've seen in a long time. And Brokerman did it. It was. It was like, it's like watching an intense game of cards where neither Frederick Follestad or Renz Brokerman really knew what the other one had to give. And then... Those last two or three laps, they just went at it hammer and tong. That is what we had been waiting to see. And, you know, debatably, two of, what, the two, best, or two of the best drivers currently driving in this championship, going at it despite their different car classes, just fantastic to watch. Brilliant racing. And you say that about the cards. Follestad, he had himself a full hours for the majority of this race, but it just looks as though... Those final three laps, Renz Brokerman, he knew that he was holding on to a Royal Flux and indeed he managed to take victory by 1.2 seconds across the line. We're going to go through our race results. Um, I'm just going to have to chat. I believe we are going to still have to go with the Cadillac class first. So we'll go with the Cadillac class. Your results in the Caddy class. Frederick Follestad is your race winner in the Cadillac class. Um, Joe Jr. comes home in the second position. Adam Terry in third. Tara Dalberg in fourth. Seven Coppins in fifth. Adam Paul in the sixth position. Ian Mabbitt in seventh. Scott Malcolm one lap down in eighth. Roderick Cronin three laps down in ninth. Um, I say a Mayo is your first retiree in tenth, as is Dan Steele, Nick Fasici, Andy Kerestoff, and Kevin Vikermans. And then in the V8 supercars, not only did he win that class, he won the overall race of a time of 30 minutes, 6 seconds, point six zero four. Thomas Van Boosten in second, Fabian J in third, Danny Bowles in fourth, Andy Griffiths in fifth, Andy Goodison in the sixth position, Phil Jostelen in seventh, Isabel Ballow in eighth, Christian Nielsen in ninth, Simon Hill in tenth, William Piner in eleventh, Andrew Street in twelfth, Peter Ridley thirteenth, your retirees, Dave Geimer and Robert Burson, who did not start the race. And... So that's the first time I've ever had to say that about the V8 car winning 
But overall, this was a very good race. But unfortunately, we lost ourselves some big names at the start. And for Stigi and Kerstoff, it seems as though the radical curse continues. Indeed it does. I mean, well, I don't know. It, it was horrendous luck. I mean, we knew that there were going to be possible comings together with the cars this match. I mean, they're, not, they're used to having to race a grid of 14, and what they had to do here was race a grid of 30. And it just threw so much at them. And it, I, on the whole, well dealt with by the drivers. And it was really good driving. But that's good. And like you said, it's just that radicals curse. All those mistakes seem to occur next to a radicals car. And for Top Freak Racing as well, they had a bit of a difficult day as well. Um, we've seen a couple of drivers at the team something, um, some hard times. We saw earlier on Dave Geimer driving for Team Shark. He had himself a hard day. He finished pretty much second from bottom in the V8 class with only his teammate Robert Burton, who didn't start the race lower down. So, and none of these teams having some very hard days here today. Um, Joe Jr., he did well getting second position. A well-deserved result for him in the number 20 car. Um, after so much bad luck in this series, it is nice to see Joe Jr. get himself a string of results together in this middle portion of the season. And drivers like Stefan Coppins as well in the number 81 machine flying the flag for Talk Creek Racing there. Yeah, I mean... I think everyone who finished on the lead lap after some of the early shenanigans really did themselves proud and actually, given the number of people that did manage to finish on the lead lap, 16 overall across both the classes, you're getting good points and good results if you keep it clean and yeah, this race was definitely one to prove it. Okay, come. So, we are going to talk to some random people now. Um, who are we going to start with? We'll start with Joe Jr. Hello, Joe Jr. came home second in the number 20 machine. So, you did yourself um, a nice drive there, but that must have been crazy with the V8s all around you. Uh, that was really fun, actually. At first, I was kind of... Um, I wasn't happy that the V8s were going to be mixing it up with us, but it turned out okay, and I had a brilliant race with Adam. Now, take us through your strategy, because it looks as though you weren't really involved in too many fights with the V8s, but on those first couple of laps especially, knowing the fact that you could pull away a little bit, but then you'd have V8s filling up your rear view mirror into places like the bus stop and turn number one, did you just pay much attention to them, or was it just, you know, one of those multi-class distractions that you just drove through it? Well, um... I knew I, yeah, I knew if they were really close behind on the street, I could not hold them, no matter what I did. So I just let them go and try to gain enough time on the infield so that um, they wouldn't get back past me. And second position over, um, in the V8 uh, in the Cadillac class for that number twenty um, still series radical machine. Um, good middle part of the season. Um, you had some difficult times at the start, but this middle um, part of the season does seem to be getting itself a little bit better for you. Yeah, I failed last week at Sebring. Obviously, I didn't practice. Uh, I did a lot more practice here, and I still managed to mess up my qualifying. But, yeah, it's a surprisingly good race. Too bad for my teammates, though. And, yeah, I have to say, it was very tough luck um, for a number of your teammates. In fact, I believe we have Andy Karistoff uh, here as well. Andy K, um, your race was just not where you wanted it to be. No, it didn't go very well, did it, really? Um, well, we have Joe talking about how he enjoyed the um, V8 slash um, Cadillac battle. You were one of the unfortunate victims of it. Um, how difficult was the start of that race with not only two different car classes, but two different car classes and 31 degrees of bank... Well, 15 degrees, I'll be fair. 15 degrees of banking um, with different amounts of torque coming down into turn number one really difficult because you had to start on pretty much no revs at all and just get off with uh, making sure that you didn't provide any uh, wheel spin which is a bit of a nightmare but the the key issue was people not taking taking it careful into t1 um you have to be aware that with all the different car classes you said coming into t1 there may be accidents so you've got to have an element that says i've got to be cautious to try and get round and I was cautious for the accident that happened ahead of me, and the people behind uh, weren't. 
And in fact, probably alongside turn number one at Sebring and Suzuka, um, turn one here is one of the most difficult um, of the entire series, just for the simple fact that it tightens up so quickly and you have the attenuator um, between the track and pit wall that just suddenly decides that it wants to dart out. Yeah, absolutely. It really does narrow. But saying that, I got to leave the server and watch the stream, which was absolutely fantastic tonight. And uh, yeah, all compliments to to Renz for taking the overall win. I mean, that's absolutely sensational driving from him. And because you're an Englishman, I'm guessing you're looking forward to next week from around number nine at Silverstone. Absolutely. Come on, bring it. Um, well, tough luck for you in this race. I haven't seen the football score, but. Um, is it is it good or is it bad? Oh, it's a good score. Good. <laughs> um, meanwhile, we'll head over to Frederick Follestad. Frederick, once again, you managed to win in the Cadillac class, but you kind of got upstaged by V8 at the end. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. It was. It's actually pretty scary to drive along and and sort of knowing how much I need on the banking and just seeing it gradually <laughs> being chipped away at. So, that was scary. Now, take me through your thought process, because you had yourself a 31 second gap between yourself and second position um, in, your in your class. But it looked as though you were fighting for pride on those last three laps, not only for yourself, but for the entire Cadillac part of things. I mean, how difficult was it to race a car where you had one distinct area of advantage, but he had the other, and he kind of had the overall advantage because of the length of the straightaways. Yeah, what happened uh, in practice, I was actually a little bit quicker. So um, I don't know what happened in that race. I couldn't do the same. I couldn't do the same lap times for whatever reason. Um, so at the end there, I just I trust Rance. He's a really good driver. So I just decided to have some fun because I I knew at that point that uh, I was never, unless he did a mistake somewhere, I was never going to win overall. And you made the bold move into the International Horseshoe twice on the third and second to last lap. Um, how, how close was that heart to your mouth as you came into, the, into turn number three? <laughs> I think it might have looked more dramatic than it was. Uh, I think the second time Renz did a mistake. Um, he seemed to lock up or something because he went very wide, so I just put the car in the gap. Um, and I think he, he, I think he liked it because uh, we've been driving like that in practice as well. And moving away from the craziness of Daytona, um, it's time to go to England for some tea and scones, and um, the only track of the season in England. But Silverstone. Uh, it's kind of back to normal for the um, Cadillacs, and you, sh no, you should have a bit more of a distinct advantage. Um, but for yourself, what do you think you, you get, how, how do you think you're going to be faring? Um, not that good, actually, because I've never, ever been quick at Silverstone. Um, back in the R-Factor days as well, I was always slower compared to my enemies. That's what I call them. <laughs> In, uh, at Silverstone for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so I'm hoping um, iRacing gets Monza because there I was always quicker, uh, sort of. Well, if you're going to talk about Monza, I'm going to talk about Rockingham. Get the real Rockingham, not the piece of no. whatever in America. The real Rockingham in, the, in England. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think right. anyone's allowed to do that at the moment because it's just rubbing salt into the wounds of Live for Speed, but I won't go into that. <laughs> we we won't talk about or... other Sims, honest. No, <laughs> no, I, I best not. I'll probably get sued or something. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, um, iRacing is awesome. For more information, go to iRacing.com. Meanwhile, it is time on that bombshell to end the show. Next week, the Torque Freak Racing Touring Car Championship will be coming to you from Silverstone, the Grand Prix Silver at Silverstone, home of some of the most famous race corners in the world. Corners like Beckett, Maggot, Cops, Club, 
Vale. I, don't, I could do the list all day long, just reeling out a list of corners. But that will be coming on to you next Tuesday, same time and same place. Um, coming up for the rest of the week, we have got ourselves the Big Dog Racing dot com. Uh, Mechlack Motorsports 125 at Irmondale tomorrow evening. Um, we have got ourselves the Torquay Racing Summer Super Cup on Saturday. We have got ourselves the Afterburn IndyCar Series time yet to be confirmed. And we have got ourselves the Grand Am Premier Series two hours at the Glen with the Daytona Prototypes and the Ford Mustangs. Special presentation time of that for 4 p.m. GMT. That is going to be one of the best races you'll see all year long, and that will be coming to you on Sunday. And just to let you know, the Big Dog Racing lead is actually tonight, not tomorrow night. I completely apologize for that. And it is now, on that mistake, time to say goodnight. So we will see you all tonight for the Big Dog Racing 125 at Irondale and for the Torquic Racing Summer Super Cup on Saturday.